Okay. Hello. Welcome. Everybody. Good to see you. Welcome to Inside Out. Um, lectures which are all about exploring the designed environment, if you've seen our wonderful poster. It's a real pleasure for me, actually, this one, and a real honour to invite Dinah, Dinah Casson, to come and give this talk to us here at the RCA. Along with Roger Mann, Dinah formed Casson Mann in 1984, and since 94, this is um, stuff I've been looking at on your website, since 94 has primarily focused on museums, installations, galleries, permanent and touring exhibitions, and a wide variety of interpretive and narrative environments. And Dinah and Roger pretty much, and, the, and Cass and Mann, have pretty much done all of this wonderful work in all of the major museums in the UK, and galleries in the UK, and also across the, wor the world, ranging from Moscow through to Philadelphia and many, many other places. And I, for all of our students here, I strongly recommend that you look at Cass and Mann's website, and you can see the huge breadth and quality and depth of the wonderful work that they do. I've known Dinah for a number of years now, actually. My first teaching job was in Cardiff many moons ago, which is where I first met Dinah. And Dinah was the external examiner there. And I was struck by sort of a fantastic person and such a, such a great character. So for me, as I said, it's a real honor. But really, also, beyond that, what you need to understand is Dinah's really closely connected to us here at the RCA in many, many ways. Not only is she our external examiner and has been for the last two years, I think, so she'll have another year or two with us at least, hopefully more if we can, but she was also previously did my role as a head of programme for architecture, but specifically interior design. So she is hugely connected to us here. But more than that, what you may not realise is that Diana's father was the designer of this building that we actually sit in as well. So her DNA, so to speak, is really closely connected to this building, to this programme and to this college. So I'm not going to carry on much more because I'm sure she'll, she'll cover some of the stuff that I've just mentioned, but uh, I'd really like to offer a very warm welcome to Dinah and uh, hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you. Well, uh, Graham's asked me to talk under this topic of a sense of place, um, which uh, luckily for him um, is something rather close to my heart. And um, it's something that's been preoccupying me and us in the office quite a bit recently. Um, I wouldn't recommend you go to our website because we've been trying to redesign it for about four years, I suppose. And um, we just, we're always just on the edge of saying that's it, and then something happens. But um, this, I'll just give you a few images of um, um, suggest where we started, our first little project, this ice cream shop in Knightsbridge. We then did um, building in Bedford Square, which was um, headquarters for the Chartered Society of Design. So it's like having 6,000 designers as your client, which is not something I would recommend. And then we decided that we wanted to get into uh, museums. And this was really because um, in your working life, you're on your side of the table and your client's on the other side of the table. And it, the sort of work we were doing, apart from one or two very nice jobs, was sort of offices and all that stuff. And really, the dialogue and the conversations were not interesting. And so we thought that the conversations in museums would be more interesting, that curators would be more interesting and indeed they have turned out to be um, as well as lots of other things but it took about two years for us to break into this because it's you know like a lot of areas in in i suppose it's architecture as well but certainly interiors you know if you haven't done one um then everyone's very suspicious of you and so um you have to sort of find somebody on the other side with a bit of faith and finally, we found someone. And so this was our very first project, which was for very small people, for three to six-year-olds, at the Science Museum. And um, it was supposed to last for six years. And, it, and people are now taking their, certainly their children, maybe even grandchildren? Not sure. Yeah. But anyway, pretty, pretty <laughs> no, nearly. Anyway, it's been there a very long time. 
And then we went on to do almost one of the biggest projects we've ever done. So the first, that first time was about 600,000 pounds. This was 7 million, so it was quite a jump over the road. v &A, British Galleries, I might come back to that. Um, and we, so we did um, projects which had very small things, as portrait miniatures, um, abstract things, which is um, Science Museum, who am I? Um, and um, low-tech things for the beanie in um, Canterbury. This is a sort of cabinet of curiosities sort of project. Um, and um, the role that we started to play was this thing, because you get a brief from a curator. You then, you then act as a sort of interpreter for it, and you then design it. And um, this, um, the quality of the briefs that you get vary a lot. Um, partly the topic, but also the, the intelligence and the structure and, and what it's about. Um, but we're, we're now finding that there are many, many pressures on museum curators to make sense of the stuff that they want to talk about. And increasingly, we're finding that a sense of place, which, and I'll try and explain why this helps as an idea, helps to sort of ground, in a very literal way, um, what, what it is that we do with them. And on top of this, um, there's pressure from the main funding body, which is the Heritage Lottery Fund, that gives a lot of money to public museums to help them. So let's look at, um, and I'll come back to that too. So if we think about what sense of place means, one obvious sense is it's a place where something's happened. So here you've got the Cabinet War Rooms, um, which is where um, Churchill held up during the war. Not all the time, actually, but he was there a lot of the time. Um, and at the end of the war, they just closed the door and left it. And then they reopened it in the 60s. Um, and that, that was where he slept when he had to. Um, but it's a very evocative place. It's a very strong place. Here are the maps. Here are the telephones. Here is the place where everyone was. Similarly, um, Pompeii. Here's a place where something happened. It's, it's very, very powerful when you go there. It's, it's sort of very moving. Not only these figures, but I mean, the whole atmosphere is, is very powerful. There's Ellis Island. I don't know if any of you know it, but it's, um, it's in New York. Um, and you, you arrive in this island uh, where all those migrants came, or immigrants, potential immigrants. And they looked out through the window, and they could see not quite as high then as it is now, but they could see New York across the water. But they couldn't necessarily get there, because unless they passed all the tests and things, um, they weren't allowed in. Some of them, if they had flu or something, might have been sent all the way back again and never actually quite got there. So this place, again, very, very powerful, very, very evocative. Or it might be about a place where somebody lived. So here we've got Wellington and Apsley House. You've got Freud's house, where... Um, these are feathers taken from the pillow where his patients lay on the couch. And these are Cornelia Parker, Cornelia Parker project. And she's imagining what these feathers heard, what they knew, what they know. But a place where all sorts of things happened, all sorts of extraordinary stories came out. This is Plechnik's house in Ljubljana. And this is Melnikov's house in Moscow. I mean, I'm darting around because they're all terribly, terribly different, but they're all very, very powerful. And the Melnikov House in Moscow, which we did a, a project on, um, is a really extraordinary little project. I think, Graham, you'll have to do a little exercise on the Melnikov House because it is absolutely extraordinary. Um, this is the planning, <laughs> planning application. It is, so it's a sort of double cylinder dropped into this little bog. And... Um, this is the interior. Um, I mean, it's 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 got it's got hundreds and complicated stories. It's completely extraordinary. And those, that stove on the left was designed by Melnikov because he was thrown out of the union. He couldn't work as an architect for a long time, so he designed stoves. And then 
And it might also be a place where something is a way of life. This is a museum in Carrara, which is made by a marble worker. And um, it's one of, the, one of the places where, where um, tears have come to my eyes in, a, in visiting a museum, which is quite an interesting test, actually. And this is another place, um, uh, which is Gortelli in, um, um, on the west coast of Italy, which is a house of objects collected by a teacher who was, who was trying to explain to his pupils what life in the countryside was like, and it sort of got a bit out of hand. So, um, you know, he went on and on and on, and the house got full and full and full, and he decorated every surface, even the ceilings and things. It's the most magical place. Anyway, um, so um, it, it can, it can um, be a place, but this sense of place can also be um, something that you try and create. So as designers, if you're trying to show objects, you're quite often trying to create a sense of a place um, in order to enhance the object. So this is an exhibition we did for the V&A about Art Deco. Um, and both of these little snapshots are showing how a little bit of film, so there's um, Josephine Baker doing her banana dance in front of Eileen Gray furniture, brings us solidly into Paris. And these um, changing images behind the models of Lincoln Center um, brought us firmly into New York. Without these, somehow the um, objects wouldn't have made so much sense. Um, Another example is this, um, which is not going to work, which is a pity, um, a full-size projection onto a wall of the office in the Foreign Office where Ian Fleming worked. His filing cabinet, um, his... Oh, maybe this one will work. No, it's not going to work. It's a movie. Anyway, um, his filing cabinets, is the clock on the wall. That, so it tells a number of stories... Um, through this projection. But because the projection fills the wall, it, you feel that you're in this room. Um, and then another example, which is what I'm going to talk to you about a bit more, is, is uh, it's not um, a sense of place, it is the place, which is um, Lascaux in France, where we're doing a big project. Um, so in order to explore a bit more of why why these places are so interesting and why they touch us in a very special way. Um, I'm going to, I mean, some of the ones that I've shown you are sort of house museums, and there are quite a lot of them in, in France and in um, uh, Russia. This is the Rodin Museum um, in Paris, but you, you, you're there and you're thinking, this is the light that Rodin had when he was working. This is, this is the quality of the space that he sat in. This is where he thought. And so, so it has a sort of um, the proportion of the room, the decoration of the room, the light that comes in is all gathering together to make something. It's similarly, this is, the, um, this is Dostoevsky's apartment in um, St. Petersburg, and there is his hat sitting on the pool table. It's incredibly moving. Um, and it's how strange that wallpaper is, you know, how odd the whole proportion of the place is. Now, the point is... Oh, this is, this is really weird. This is um, where de Gaulle ended up, uh, in um, <coughs> Colombe de, uh, des... Uh, Les Des Eglises. And um, I put radio on last night and somebody was talking about being in this building and he was sort of shutting the door out. This is really very, very weird. Anyway, again, a very powerful, evocative place. But the thing is, if you were to take all these objects out, that's what normally happens with museums. You take the objects out of where they were born, as it were, and you take them to a museum and you put them in a display case. So... Here you have this little object. And um, I uh, sat next to somebody at dinner once who was a, he was a, um, a retired curator from the British Museum. So I said, do you ever go and see the objects that you bought for, your, for the museum? And he said, oh, you mean my orphans? 
And I thought, well, that's an incredibly powerful idea. And, and then I suddenly thought that, you know, all these objects, you know, they have their little... Here they are. They're kind of characters with their own stories, with their own provenance, with their own little cardboard suitcase. And they're put into a vitrine with other little objects with their own suitcases and their own stories. And they're supposed to somehow get on. It's like taking your children to a birthday party or something. And they... Um, and this, this um, isolation, suddenly, this idea that these objects feel very isolated without the sense of place, without their context, that they're, they're sort of lost. So to, to try and... Our, our job as designers is to try, and, to try and give them this context. Um, but the really interesting thing, of course, is that, is that all museums are, in a sense full of Lewis, those little chessmen. You know, they, they, the, a curator arrives in the museum and they open their cupboards and they think, bloody hell, you know, what am I going to do with this lot? And um, they, of course, they have headline stories that they're supposed to tell the history of, you know, the story of, uh, but actually, no collection is, is very complete because they've all been put together by gifts from people, by... Um, some previous curator who was obsessed with diving boots, um, you know, somebody, or, or that the, the collection has got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these chronometers. This is the um, Maritime Museum in Greenwich. This thing is extraordinary. This is the post box for St Kilda. So you put your letter in this little box, you close the lid, you blow up this sheep's bladder, you chuck it into the sea... And you hope somehow that your letter's going to drift across the water and get there. Um, well, how do you how do you make a gallery, you know, out of these weird um, objects that don't sort of naturally glue together? And this is the great um, problem that that uh, all these curators have. And in a way, uh, one school of curatorial thought is that you you just think big. Because if you want to do the story of biodiversity and you're a bit short of a few stuff, whatever, you go to the stuff shop, you know, the stuffing shop, and you, you fill in. And um, they all want to tell the story of the world. I mean, that's the sort of main thing most museums want to tell. So, but they didn't have a, curate, um, a um, dinosaur. So you, you can go to the dinosaur shop and you get a dinosaur and you sort of fill in all the bits. But you can't always do that. And... Um, so quite often what uh, curators do is that rather than doing chronological stories where the gaps in the collection become very obvious, they um, do thematic um, stories. So um, it's sort of loosely chronological, but the fact that they don't have everything is covered by the fact that it's thematic. So, for example, when we were doing the British galleries at the V&A, um, the... <coughs> The story started with Henry VIII, but the only thing they had for Henry VIII was um, the portrait on the end there and his, his sort of portable laptop, which was his little writing desk. And they had this bust of his dad, um, and that was it. So, so you then have to sort of skew your thematic headings to fit the fact that you've got these holes and the hope that nobody notices When we were doing the, um, Nel what's it called? Nelson Navy Nation Gallery at the at, um, Maritime Museum. Um, this is where the other pressures that I referred to from the funding council, the HLF, um, Her Her Heritage Lottery Fund, are now <coughs> coming in. Because they say um, to museums, um, you know, you're designing these things and showing all these things for um, a tiny proportion of the population, whereas the people who buy lottery tickets, um, you're not caring about them. They're, where are they? Where are their voices in all of this stuff? So, and we found that in this gallery where we were talking about um, Nelson, of course, that um, there was lots and lots of 
of um, things in the collection which belong to these guys, the officers. You know, all their sextants and their swords and their costumes and their, and their paintings of them all rushing around and their weapon. But old Jack Tarr, the, the, guy on, the guy below deck, they had absolutely nothing. They had one ship's biscuit, which is in here. They had a pair of stripy pyjamas pajama bottoms, which is what they wore on deck. And um, that was really about it. So you have to then weave a, a bigger, a, weave a wider story that somehow accommodates these omissions. And um, where this is where technology comes in. So that, for example, in this here, you've got this um, bowl, which is um, supposed to have soup in it. And um, it, it's actually... Um, spins round. It's got a little screen in there and talks about different recipes and the food that they're eating. And this this violin here, um, you touch it and it. It's supposed to play some quite nice things. It actually, plays rather ghastly sea shanties, which is um, painful. But I mean, the idea was to somehow create this below decks area. So the place is is quite evocative. The hammocks were here, they ate and they slept and they fired their guns all in one place. Um, the, the, the problem of there being no, no place for the ordinary sailor in these galleries, um, because the collections don't support them, is made worse at the moment because um, the Heritage Lottery Fund are, are putting more and more pressure. We're doing four big galleries for the for Greenwich at the moment. And, um, you know, the curators are, are left saying, well, I don't really want to make a gallery uh, which is all about dead, white, fat admirals. But the fact is, the story consists of James Cook, Bly, you know, all of them are dead, fat, white admirals. And that's the history. So... Woven into all of this was somehow having to mould the narrative and um, make it so that um, other voices can be accommodated, even though the, the collections don't support it. It's tricky. It's really tricky. Well, and I'm going to talk to you in a little bit more detail about three, three projects that were where a sense of place was a bit um, interesting, but in different ways. So this is... This is Churchill painting at um, Chartwell. This is the room that we were given for the Churchill Museum, um, designed by HOK. Uh, they had put red in the structure, and they had... This holds up the um, treasury upstairs. Um, and they'd put this delightful pine floor down. And they said that these colours were listed and we couldn't touch them. <laughs> so, um, anyway, we managed to... I mean, it's quite a hideous space to be given to put an exhibition into. Um, I don't know how clear this is. It's quite a lot of light, actually. Can we kill some of this light? It's very bright. Um, but the, what we did was to, to make a plan which was a bit like the cross-hatching of, of, of plans that maps and things that show what territory belongs to who. Um, and, and that's... I could thank you. Down the, down the middle is this... Um, thank you very much. This um, long table. So, as you can see, we managed to dull down the floor and we painted all that red structure out, made it grey. And um, we used a lot of concrete, printed onto concrete. So, um... And th this um, um, long table down the middle was a sort of lifeline, a, a, a timeline of his, of his um, life, but it became a, a lifeline. It was something that people could hang on to to work out where they were because the plan is um, not, it's not chron it's, it's chronological, but we don't start at birth. We start during the war, because you've been through the map rooms and those other rooms I showed you in the cabinet war rooms, and you come into this room, and you're in your head, you're in 1940. So um, the story in this gallery starts in 1940. You go on round, he dies, he's then born, 
and then he grows up and you hear the story of his life and then you leave again. And this thing, is a, this table is a device for um, compensation, if you like, that it's not a chronological gallery. So uh, there's a little event for every day of his life, a little film, a little letter, um, photograph, something that pops up. But I, in, in the gallery, there are a number of interactive things. And this, I think, is one of the more interesting ones in a way, because this was him talking to his fish at Chartwell. And again, you've got a screen buried in the surface, but you touch it and as if you're feeding them and he talks to them. And the other very powerful moment is this, um, is the funeral. Um, that's a very famous film that you can watch on YouTube. Um, but by editing it in a slightly different way, making it into a triptych, um, it suddenly became a film and more than a film. And again, it created a very strong sense of place. The curious thing is, that this bunker where the Churchill Museum is situated is absolutely perfect for the war because that's where, that's where it all happened. But once, you're, um, once you've finished the war and you're, you know, he's galloping through South Africa or he's um, painting or he's being in the home after something, uh, th this bunker is a pain in the neck. I mean, it's completely hopeless. It's too low. So... Um, we somehow had to find a way of um, allowing this low space to, to bring you down into um, a, a sort of way of thinking and a field of thinking, which, which um, was, so it, it was a bit more forgiving, but it, it was, it's tricky. Um, another project we did is, was for, um, this, this building in um, Moscow, which belonged to uh, this, um, the family of this man here, who was Konstantin um, Alexeyev. And um, he ran this factory during the day, and in the evenings he changed his name to Stanislavski, and he went to the Moscow Art Theatre, and he worked with um, Chekhov and the rest of them to make modern theatre. Um, and our client um, wanted to, he's converting this very long, thin building which made gold and silver thread, which is why the, comp the family was so um, well off. Um, this was the entrance he was making into a big business centre because there was a, actually behind a campus of lots of other buildings. So this, this was a, a big entrance here for a lot of people <coughs> coming in and out all through the day. And he wanted to have something in the foyer that talked about Stanislavski, but he didn't want it to be a museum. He wanted it to be a lobby, and he called it a museo lobby. It's very good. I think Russians are very good at making new words. And um, so it, he, the, the great thing was for it not to be a museum, because there is a Stanislavski museum in Moscow, which is, which is this. this. This is the, the flat they gave him to live in. This had a ballroom in it here. And this is him continuing to teach as an old man. And when you go there, that's a photograph, obviously. And when you go there, there is the sofa with the, with the table where they're all sitting around. But this is also interesting because this, he, he did a production of Eugene and Yegin in this ballroom with his students. And um, all productions of Eugene and Yegin for the next 30 years had these columns and nobody knew why, because the columns are not in the... It's nothing to do with the opera. It's nothing to do with anything. But because this production was so powerful, um, somehow the columns went with it as a sort of memory of place. So we took the inside of this lobby area um, and we created a sort of stage here, which in the sense that this was a, a 
porcelain floor with a, an area dropped into it which was made of wood. So you could walk straight over it, not realising. Um, the, the entrance was here, and this is a weather lobby because it gets extremely cold, as you no doubt would have guessed. So you come in through here, there's a sort of reception desk. And there's a cafe here, and there are lifts. You come through, some lifts at the back where you go off to your various offices and so on. Um, and our idea was that we would make an installation which changed all the time. So that um, the great thing about theatre is that no two performances are ever the same. And that's very important. And for generations of people now, because theatre is incredibly important in... in um, in Russia, even now. Um, I think it was always a place where other things could be said um, without fear of being arrested or whatever. So anyway, our idea was that um, there would be this installation that would be up in a fly tower that we created, and um, things would go up and down, and they would loosely tell the story of Stanislavski, but a lot of people wouldn't know what the hell was going on. But with any luck, as they walked across this wooden stage and partook of all of this, um, they would begin to get a sense of something interesting. So this particular bit is when he travelled to Munich and was arrested at the station at the beginning of the First World War. And then these, these are the sort of Greek chorus of people that go up and down commenting on him and his work and so on. Anyway, so we built the, um, we built the lobby... And there's the desk, um, and there's the fly tower up there, and the installation never happened because there was the crash, so that was that. Um, and then the third one is um, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, this is in Philadelphia, and this funny little courtyard um, is just off the old part of Philadelphia. He was the only sort of grand... Um, grandfather of America that didn't go out and buy a ranch somewhere. He stayed in the city and he had this little plot of land and he built a house. The house, as soon as he died, his family sold the house and demolished it. Um, but there's one, one watercolour of it and this is the outline of it. And Venturi won a competition um, with this structure which he called the ghost house. It's a very, very nice idea. So the outline of the house is there. The outline of the stables is here, all built of this slightly horrible white steel. And on the ground um, underneath is the map, is the, is the plan of the house, the staircase and the rooms all, all drawn out in stone. And then little quotations um, from the correspondence he had with his wife. He was in Paris most of the time or London, and she was in Philadelphia. He was very bossy and told her exactly what t colour to paint all the walls. Um, he was never there. He, had, he, he was hardly in this house. But um, the, the idea is very strong. And then the museum is underneath. Um, and it's no, it was known as the Underground Museum. Now, this, this was our sort of uh, our finished installation. But the, the basis of the idea was that um, that each of these areas in the underground museum was actually took the proportions of the rooms upstairs that were drawn on the ground. So, it, because it was this realization that your 18th century um, man of letters didn't go to an office, he was at home, and he would have worked at home, and the rooms, each room, therefore, was dedicated to an, a, an aspect of his life. So this was the bedroom, although you wouldn't think it, um, and this was all about family, and then another room was the saloon where he was, and then there was another room was his little garden shed where he was having it. Um, the Americans were very um, prude. When, when we were doing the Churchill we, Museum, we were allowed to sort of really ask difficult questions like, all about drinking and smoking and eating and all that stuff. But um, with Franklin, when we said, "But well, what about his women?" For example, they all said, "Oh no, 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 we don't, no, 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 we don't go there." So it it has a slight the, the whole place has a slightly restrained quality about it. And then the third, um, or was it the fourth? I can't remember the fourth 
story I want to tell you is about um, Lascaux in France, where we're doing this big project. Um, and, well, this is, this is an, a painted cave under the ground, and um, painted 20,000 years ago. And it was discovered in 1940 by a group of boys, and they, um, it took a while for, for people to realize how important these, this discovery was. But once they did, um, people came in their thousands and thousands and thousands to have a look at it. And what, what nobody realized, of course, is that this is a micro environment with its own humidity and the rest of it. And all of these people with their sweaty faces and excitements and oohs and ahs and breaths and the rest of it um, created a, a build-up of um, fungus which started to grow on the paintings. So um, after a while, they had to close it. Well, they tried various things. They put air conditioning. They did terrible things. They put air conditioning into it. They did, and it just got worse. So they finally closed it. And then they made um, a facsimile of it, of the first two galleries. Uh, this is this is the the most famous one, the um, Salitoro, where all the bulls are. And um, this was done sort of by hand, you know, somebody copying the walls and doing it by hand. And and the 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 journey to the museum is that you arrive and you. Um, go down some steps and you have a little lecture about it and you see some glass cases with a few little scraps of objects and what you've really come to see is this but you're not allowed in you have to have a, this lecture and then finally they let you into this room and it is actually as soon as you're in there you forget that it's not real actually um, and it's very moving um, and here they are um, restoring it. So this, this um, facsimile, this handmade facsimile, built into, the, built into the same hill, just alongside the original one, um, is now a national monument in its own right. And here they are doing a restoration project on it. So that's called Lascaux II. Um, then there's Lascaux III. And uh, this is the Part of the plan which we're involved in, where the, the cave is scanned and the um, profile is um, made from these um, glass fiber panels and painted and all the rest of it, but the whole cave is going to be built. So this poor old hill that's already got the original cave, it's got Lascaux de, and now it's got Lascaux not going to have Trois, because Trois actually is touring around the world, but it's going to have Lascaux Cat, which is us. But that's going to be massive, um, because it's not only the cave, but it's going to have a museum attached to it, which is going to be um, roughly like this. So this is a competition we did with Snow Heta. Um, so here is, here is the hill. Um, the scheme was to sort of make a cut into the hillside and to peel it back. So you slide into the, into the hill and um, you come up here in the lift and you go through a little shed, a little abri, where you have, you're somehow, you're taken from this contemporary landscape back to um, Ice Age landscape. It's a kind of curious feeling that you're, you're standing in the place that these guys, these Cro-Magnum men that were doing the paintings, it's exactly the same place. The profile of the hill is the same. The vegetation is different because um, it would be more like scrubland. And uh, there were hordes of animals going backwards and forwards and so on. But it is actually the same. It's exactly the same. It hasn't, hasn't changed. So you... You, you, you're, you're, you see a kind of big movie through a massive opening that feels like it starts with a real view of what's outside and then takes you back in time and then picks you up again 
and, uh, and you go down this long route and you enter into the facsimile, which is here. And then you come out into uh, a sort of open courtyard and then you plunge into a series of rooms. This is one, another one, another one, and another one. Um, and this is the, how the inside of the facsimile will be. It, it, it's, it's very interesting because you, you, they imagine they're going to have 4,000 people a day going through here, which is a lot of people. But you don't, you don't want it to feel like you're one of 4,000 people a day. So the idea is to keep everyone in a sort of pocket of light of their own as they go through. So they've all got a little... A little um, they're, they're not quite phones, but they're sort of little things that um, produce light. They're sort of torches, in a way. Um, and you then go into this room, um, which is, if you can imagine that you've scanned the cave, you've made the moulds, you've made the skins, which are put into the facsimile, but you can then make other skins. So these are second skins, um, where which are hanging in this room where you can then begin to interrogate. This is more the museum -y bit, where, where we don't know a huge amount, but we know a bit. So, I mean, one of the great things for me about this project is that most museum projects, there's a label at the bottom of every object saying what it is, who owned it, who made it, and why. And with these, we don't know. There's, we just don't know. We don't know why they painted these things. Why they painted them on top of each other, for example. It's, it's very intense, the painting. And there's a lot of engraving. It's, and there are a lot of really curious abstract marks, which nobody understands. And it's, it's wonderful. For me, anyway. Um, so here in this room, anyway, you're, you're able to sort of um, find out a little bit. You find out why the cave is closed. You find out the techniques they use, how they ground the pigments, and all that sort of stuff. And you're also able to see bits that um, you, you can't visit. Even in the real cave, there are parts that really are pretty impossible to get to. And then you go into um, a sort of walk through theatre space where um, you are offered the story of how this whole field of work um, began. And um, it's pretty haphazard, but it, it, it took a long time. The first cave to be found was in Spain, and the French, who were thought to be the experts on um, uh, prehistorical pre pre art, didn't accept that you could, just because you could make something very nice in, in, with a piece of... Um, Ivory it didn't mean to say you could paint those. You couldn't possibly draw like that. It, I mean, that's just ridiculous. No, Cro Magnum man, 20,000 years ago, there's no way he could have drawn like that. And um, so, so one of the, what somebody, somebody said to me, well, of course, if the guy who found the first cave had been French, it would have been accepted very quickly. But because he was Spanish, it took quite a long time. Um, and gradually over time, um, the field of work has become massive because particularly in this area of France um, there are lots and lots of caves but also in Germany and blah, 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 so they're all over the place and so um, in the, the, the next space you'll be able to do a, this is a, just one of our images but you'll be able to do a sort of virtual travel through all of the caves looking at everything and then you'll also be looking at comparative caves in other parts of the world And here they are um, making it with these um, panels, um, which they then project the images onto, and then they paint them very accurately. And what's interesting is that this is my Michelin map, which I don't know if it's not very well focused, but anyway, it's my old Michelin map from 1976. And I think that's Asco there. So all these are all other bits of cave, some of which you can go into and some of which you want. The, the, the green ones are the sort of super, super sites that you really must go and see. The, the, um, the yellow ones are pretty good. The underlined ones are 
if you're nearby, it's worth going. But Lascaux doesn't even have that. So this is interesting. This map was made um, at a time when the facsimile was there, the first facsimile, but Mr. Michelin didn't think it was worth going to see. So there's a sort of lack of um, faith in the idea of the, of the facsimile. And it's the facsimile which is the sort of last thing I really want to talk about because I think it's one of the sort of great issues of our time now, the facsimile. Uh, Doug Fishburne, um, Danish Picture, Picture Gallery, um, set up a little project last year where he took, he, he took away one of the paintings in the gallery and substituted it with a facsimile. But he didn't say which one it was. So visitors to the gallery were invited to come and to guess and find out by looking and, you know, right? So there's that one and there's that one. But here we are, I'm showing you one after the other. The, no, the visitors that went, didn't have that. They just had one of the gallery, one of the images, one of the paintings wasn't, wasn't original. 12.5% of the visitors got it right, which is tiny because an awful lot of experts were, thought this was a really good challenge and they were going to go in and sort it. And a lot of people who might have known better um, and didn't. And certainly when you see them together, it's pretty obvious which, which is the copy or the facsimile. So I think there's a slight difference between a copy and a facsimile. So... Um, The, the, the point is that the, the Lascaux cave, if you go to TripAdvisor, it's actually full of people saying what a wonderful time they've had, how they went to this, they understood that the original arm was closed, but they, they, they drove all this way and they got there and they went into that cave and they just thought it was the best thing ever. They just thought it was completely wonderful and they all come out with beating hearts. And then it occurred to me, of course, that actually what this is about is pilgrimage. So that it's like going to Graceland's or something, you know, that the, the journey there, the excitement <coughs> of being there, um, being close to this place, this person who you revere and think is very special, um, gives you a sort of buzz that, that nothing else can. And... You know, there are times when the, when the pilgrimage, the aspect of the pilgrimage, is almost more important than the, than the looking. I mean, this is a bit unfair, but, but you do often see people with their backs to what it is that they've come to see, being photographed in front of the thing that they've come to see, because they need to register that they have been there. And that's, it's a bit like the Hajj or something. You know, it's the same sense of needing to travel. And... As far as facsimile is concerned, you know, there are many of our monuments which are already completely, which are facsimiles. They're completely rebuilt. This is Temple Church in London. This is Hampton Court, completely you know, rebuilt. Or Upper, completely gutted, rebuilt. It does look a little bit pristine. It's a facsimile. And yet people, will, people still go to see it. I mean, there are a lot of objects in it which I think are original, but... Um, and then, of course, we've got the reality of what we're going through now, which is um, this Palmyra, Bamiyan, before and after. And, um, you know, one person's had this idea that you can... There's a lot of discussion about the, the Buddhas and whether they should be rebuilt, but I think they've decided at the moment not to do it. But this, this person decided to do a projection onto the surface of where, where it was. Um, and, you know, people like um, Simon Jenkins are very bullish about all of this and saying we're too sentimental about all of this. And um, what's wrong with the facsimile? You know, um, we live with them and we, we um, accept them. So why, why are we so bothered? Um, but it leads to the more difficult problem, which is that 
Um, if we're going to make facsimiles of Lascaux, for example, why don't we have one in um, one in the States and one in China and one in India? And why don't we have lots of them? And then no, people don't have to travel in aeroplanes to come and see all these. We can make an upark in... Um, well, in fact, some public schools, I think, are building facsimiles of their schools in China in order to run education programs and so on. Um, but I think it comes back to sense of place. I think unless you're in the place or near the place, I think that the validity of it runs away. Anyway, that's, my, that's, the, that's the thought I leave you with. Thank you very much.